everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. There's more food. Uh, thank you, Orlando, for your consistent delivery of delicious stuff. Uh, welcome to the Aventura Turnbull Jewish Center. Um, I, I was asked to introduce the speaker. Hi. Hi. I'm the speaker. My name is Lion Roth. Some people call me Lenny. I've been a member of the synagogue since 2007, 2008, um, doing a version of this speaking series for at least 10, probably 12 years. And it's great to see a lot of familiar faces. I noticed that you know we kind of peaked before COVID and then tapered off a little bit. Uh, did some on Zoom for a year and just really no substitute to being here in person and uh, embracing the fact that there's a much more of a semblance of normalcy in this community. Uh, shout out to Mayor Enid Wiseman, who's the outgoing mayor of Aventura. She served two very capable terms, close friend, and also a member of the synagogue. And given the you know, political challenges that she had to deal with in office, I think the topic that we have to speak about today is kind of another reason why we should feel lucky we are where we are. Um, every November, sort of mid-late November, I sit down with the two rabbis and Suzanne, and we talk about what would be an interesting series of topics that, that the audience may enjoy in January, February, March. That's kind of when these classes have been given. And this year, we started selecting this in very shortly after the Israeli election in early November, when it looked like then opposition leader, former Prime Minister and current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was going to be able to form after five elections in three and a half years, a majority government. It actually looked like he would be able to do it in April of 2019, but then Lieberman and Israel Botanu balked. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So I, we've talked a lot about it. If I call him BB, that's not meant to be disrespectful in any way, shape, or form. I will try to refer to him as frequently as possible as Prime Minister Netanyahu. He likes the nickname. So the, the title of the first lecture was King BB the Third, after you know, sort of a riff on Shakespeare. What to expect from his third round at Balfour Street. Balfour Street is a, is a street in Jerusalem where the Israeli equivalent of the White House is. It's the Prime Minister's office. And then a subtitle, what Americans or Canadians sometimes don't get about, about Israel. And I think you know, there's a lot there. Some of you know this, I was actually born in Israel as a Canadian citizen on the 4th of July. So I have three passports and a congenital identity crisis. But having lived considerable time in, in, in all three countries, uh, and I know there are a lot of Canadians in the room. I think there are even some non-Canadians in the room today, but uh, there you go, too. Um, this, is, this is relevant. A friend of mine asked me if I could talk today uh, at 1 o'clock, and I said, no, I'm, I'm giving a lecture, not Jewish. She said, well, what's the topic about? So I said, it's essentially comparative constitutional law. And we didn't know back in November how dominant the topic of judicial reform was going to be. It has completely taken over the conversation of what's going on in Israel today. And let's pause for a second, because the title is King Bibi III, and refresh what we already know about Benjamin Netanyahu. He was born in Israel October 21st, 1949. He's the first Israeli prime minister who was born after the creation of the modern state. Yitzhak Rabin was born in what was then called Palestine. Uh, the, his predecessors were all born in Eastern Europe and, and came directly, various, you know, from Ben Gurion to Moshe Sharet, Levi Eshkol. Golda Meir was born in Minsk, but then grew up in Milwaukee and Denver. But Bibi was a Sabra, having grown up for a good chunk of his childhood in Philadelphia. And he also sort of had this bicultural, bilingual perspective. His brother, Yoni Netanyahu, was the commander of the raid on Entebbe and was the only uh, soldier that was killed in the operation. There were three civilians who were, who were killed during the raid. But that was iconic. 
I mean, everybody here in the room remembers July 4th, 1976, um, the U.S. bicentennial, but for those who follow Israel, uh, less than three years after the debacle of the Yom Kippur War, a real opportunity for, for pride uh, across the entire Jewish world, but not necessarily in the Tagawa family, right? Prime Minister Netanyahu lost his brother. He was he was uh, a, a member of Sayyar Makal, which is an elite special forces unit. All three brothers, there's a younger brother named Ido, who's a radiologist and also a poet. All three of them served in this unit. And Bibi came back to, uh, to Israel, wrote a book, uh, started a center, an anti-terrorist center. Clearly an exceptionally capable person who then went on to a diplomatic career, first as the deputy to Moshe Arens as the Israeli ambassador to the United States in Washington, and then Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, where he distinguished himself, particularly during the Gulf War, the first Gulf War in 1991. We sort of all remember when Israelis were putting on their gas masks, taking 39 uh, hits from Scud missiles, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, along yeah, with Ambassador Shabal, but he, he really sort of made it to the to the political political map in Israel. So fast forward, he gets elected to be the leader of the opposition when Shamir decides to uh, step away from politics. And this happens during the Oslo Accords in 1993. And here I'm gonna pause for a second. I have studied Israeli history extensively and Jewish history to some extent as well. This is by far the most divisive moment in Israel that I can recall. So I wasn't sentient during the Altalena. I was I was alive. I wasn't alive during the Altalena. I wasn't alive during the Lavon affair. Um, I was alive during and, and active during Oslo, and I remember very spirited disagreements about whether or not one can shake hands with. You know, an incorrigible terrorist like Yasser Arafat. I was certainly around and engaged in 2005 when then Prime Minister Sharon uh, announced the disengagement from Gaza. People in Israel, most of them drove around with either a blue or an orange ribbon on their antenna to demonstrate which side of the argument they're on. But even those two never felt this vitriolic. The tenor of the discussion, the protests, are so ingrained that I didn't think Israel would come close to the rancor that existed here in the United States during the Trump presidency. It seems like every president, Biden's an exception, but starting from sort of Newt Gingrich and Clinton, and then it got worse with Bush, and then it got worse with Obama, and then it got the worse with Trump. When I say the worst, I mean in terms of the schism, in terms of the antipathy that the folks who hated the president, you know, the enthusiasm with, it, with which the president was, was detested. And even I mentioned al Talen, right? When I talk to Palestinians about a prospective peace process, I suggest that the Palestinians could benefit from an al Talen moment. For those of you who don't know what happened, the al Talen was a ship that with the um, Edsel, the Menachem Begin group, were bringing arms into uh, Palestine to help fight the War of Independence. And David Ben Gurion said, "There's no separate arms shipment. There's only one uh, army. Uh, you know, the Afshu, the Haganah, and I control it. We control it. We cannot have parallel militia running their own battles." And the Irgun refused to give up the ship, so they sunk it, and 11 people died. And it was, it was a tragedy. And however history judges Menachem Begin, I think this was one of the greatest acts of statesmanship in human history, let alone Jewish history, where he basically said we cannot have a civil war. We can just not tolerate a civil war. And 11 people died because the ship was sunk. Precious arms, cargo that this nascent state needed to survive were lost. And the leader, of the faction who sort of engineered all of this stands up and says, we are not gonna spill any more blood over this, enough is enough. And from that moment on, there was never any confusion. There was lots of dissension, 
I mean, there was another Nazi reparations, also an extremely emotional debate in Israel in the 1950s. And German reparations, sorry, German reparations for, 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 for Nazi uh, atrocities. So here we are where we had five elections. The first four were inconclusive. There were various coalitions. BB and Guns put together a Corona emergency coalition. I don't mean to go through all of those. But all of this was taking place when Prime Minister Netanyahu was indicted and on trial for three, uh, three separate affairs. And the charges involved fraud and bribery and breach, breach of trust. And it was amazing that somebody who's going through all that was also running the country. He's on record for having said when Edward Olmert was under investigation that you cannot run a country and be distracted by all of this. You can't be distracted by all this and run a country. I guess that, that didn't apply as much to him, but he's not the first politician to change his mind when, when it gets very personal. And when he was in the opposition for, for a year and a half, he was single-mindedly focused on getting back into the Premier's office. And I traveled to Israel in March with uh, Mayor Daniela Levine Kava as part of a delegation from Miami-Dade County. She's actually going to be here at the synagogue on April 2nd, so this is a shout out. It's a Sunday morning, it's a brunch, and, and, and you're all invited to register. I'm sure you'll see this in your, in your inboxes. And we were treated to a dinner where um, Prime Minister Netanyahu was present and spent literally a few hours and here's a man, a Renaissance man, who's got a scope of knowledge and experience that one can learn from, one would think, theoretically, you know, for forever, all he wanted to talk about. The only thing that interested him was finding the one traitor from the coalition that he could peel off, topple this government, and, and have a chance to form one of his own again. So I have to applaud his focus, right? Not sports, not geography, not international relations, not Ukraine. All he wanted to do was talk about how he can get back to Balfour. And he did. It turns out that Edith Zilman from the Amina party, in retrospect, had to already be on board. So he, he knew what he was cooking up because four days after we got back here, she bolted and that was sort of the beginning of the end of the, um, you know, the Pied and Bennett, Bennett alliance. So now Bibi's back in power with 64 votes. The Israeli electoral, electoral system is very different from that in the United States and Canada. I'm going to talk about each of them in a, different, in a second and they're different. But very quickly, not a month later, not six months later, within a few days, the first thing that the government does is introduce this judicial reform. I know this is Bibi's sixth term in office, right? He served one term from 96 to 99. He served four terms from 2009 to 2021, and now this is the sixth term. But it's the first time where when he looks to his left, he doesn't see anybody. So think about a car with you know, three seats in the front, and the, 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 the person in the middle has control of the steering wheel. And people on each side are trying to veer into their direction. The person on the right to the right, the person on the left to the left. So he was always able to say to the person who's veering into the right, I'd love to go in your direction, but, I've got so-and-so. I've got Sipi Livni. I've got Ehud Barak. I've got Moshe Kahlon. I've got somebody here. Now there's nobody here. He looks to his left and there's nobody there. It's the first time that he doesn't have a foil. He doesn't have a straw man, as they say, to, uh, to avoid this, this inclination to take him in a direction that if you, you know, you, you, you can judge him already. He's been prime minister for over 15 years. He has a record. He has not been prone to military adventurism. He's been pretty good about preserving the status quo, understanding the different constituencies. Uh, he's very polarizing as a personality. He alienated a lot of his former colleagues and, and, and mentees and people that he mentored. Naftali Bennett, Gidon Saar, Victor Lieberman. They all went off to form their own parties. And, much of their political, um, you know, platform is anything but BB. But the country realized that, that you can't just survive on 
BB or not BB, right? You have to have you have to have something more concrete. And I think this is where the left is the center. There is no left in Israel anymore. I mean, if you think about the evisceration of I mean, I'm looking around the room. Many people here are old enough maybe to remember the creation of the state of Israel. But if you look at the first 29 years of Israel, oh, Mapai, Mapam. I mean, it was David Ben-Gurion and Moshe Dayan and Shimon Peres and, and, and Yigal Alon and uh, people who in various constellations ran the country until the great Mapach, the great um, revolution in 1977, when in the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, by the way, the, the, the um, Labor Party won the first election after the Yom Kippur War in 1974. Golda stepped down, Yitzhak Rabin took over, he got elected, but the, the country was, was, was riven by, by that tragedy and the perception of mismanagement. Uh, Rabin himself had to resign because his wife held foreign bank accounts. So then Begin comes in, and since then, Israel has veered gradually to the, to the right, but not precipitously. When you look at the 1992 election, when Tzach Rabin got elected the second time, his Labour Party got 44 votes. Meretz had 12 votes. So the two of them together had 56 votes. Remember, this is a unicameral, one, one has Knesset with 120. It's in 61 to govern. That seems, that's 30 years ago, it seems like forever ago, where the two of them got 56 votes in 1992, <coughs> The two of them got four seats in 2022. From 56 to four. Merritt's didn't even make it over the electoral threshold. The great giant Labour Party got four votes. So there's no hope for the left to um, regain sort of control of Israel like it had during the first 30 years or that it shared for part of the next 15 years. I think that period is over. It's, period, it's, 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 it's over and for all of our lifetimes, maybe my daughter's lifetime will see somebody else, but I don't see that happening for at least another 30 years. However, that doesn't mean that they're politically neutered, right? The, the left and center left can still have a very strong voice. If you look at the previous coalition that lasted a year, Mansour Abbas from the Arab Party Ram had four votes and he was the controlling, he, I mean, he could have gone to the good. And then, and, you know, they said they would never sell with him. BB was actually going to make a deal with him. Saul Smotrich, who now heads the religious Zionist party, said there's no way I'm joining that. So, to his credit, whether you, you know, believe in principle or not, he said, I'm not going to let, you know, political, political priorities um, trump my ideology. So, that coalition fell. I don't know whether in the future election Labour will get four or eight, um, and some other left, left of center party merits gets reconstituted. They merge, they can have 12, but, but, but holding power in Israel is just such a remote possibility for that faction that they're really struggling on how to um, maintain political relevance and stop what they see as this runaway train. And that's why we're seeing all the protests. Nobody likes to lose. The Republicans did not like losing in 2020. Um, and on January 6, 2021, you had an insurrection in Washington. That's what it was. People died. You had an insurrection in Washington. Uh, Bolsonaro supporters in Brazil didn't like to lose in 2022. They had a scaled down version of January 6. We don't need to look in the West, everywhere. Nobody likes to lose an election. And it's only natural when you lose to point fingers, um, blame the other party, but now it's gone to the point where the winners are evil, the winners cheated, um, and the animus that exists in Israel today is, 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 is troubling, because I have friends on the left and the right, but I never thought of them as being on the extreme left or the extreme right. I thought of them being fairly centrist. There's nothing centrist about their perspectives on what's going on. So what's going on? Uh, I'm sure there's the variable levels of appreciation of what's in the judicial reform package. Let's study for a few minutes. So Israel does not have a constitution. And everybody here who either grew up in Canada or the United States talks about federalism, talks about the separation of powers. It's the first thing you learn in grade school, certainly in the United States. It's the beginning of the constitution. You've got articles one, two, and three that delineate the executive. 
the uh, the legislature and and the and the judiciary. So you have checks and balances. But, you know, you're, you're, you're taught these like a catechism. These are checks and balances, so no one branch of government can be too powerful. Israel never had that. Israel never promulgated a constitution. And I don't think Israel ever will. There are two chasms that can't be bridged. One is the Orthodox secular, and the other is Jewish era. There's no way you can put in anything that would resemble a Western-style civil liberty equality. Right? How do you... How do you if you say that all Jews and all Arabs have got to be treated equally in every way, then any discrepancy, however justified by national security considerations or otherwise, would be litigated. And Ben Gurion didn't avoid a constitution for those reasons. He just didn't want anybody telling him what to do. Uh, this whole concept of rule of law came later. Israel historically had a very weak judiciary because they're, they're not entrenched in the constitution. Sure, we'll have a court. And it's only a two-level court. Right here you've got... Um, and this is true in Canada and the United States, where there are going to be differences, I'll, I'll, I'll share them. Because I introduced myself, I neglected to share that I, you know, I went to law school here, but I clerked for the Canadian Supreme Court, so I have a little bit of a perspective on both legal systems. The, the Israeli Supreme Court was historically very weak. And in the early 90s, Justice Aaron Barak uh, was, he wasn't yet president of the court, but he looked to Canada, and I'm going to, pay a little more attention to our Canadian friends and remind you, you know, that in 1982, after a lot of wrangling, Prime Minister Trudeau, not, not the son, Justin, the father, Pierre, was, um, was finally able, after years, to get the provinces to agree to patriate the Constitution, to bring it home from Great Britain. Anytime you wanted to have an amendment to what was called the British North America Act, which was an enabling act of Canadian, Canadian federalism, you have, to, you have to have the Privy Council in, in, in London uh, rule on it. So it, it was patriated. It was called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And it was a document that a lot of people admired. Think about the US Constitution, but with close to 200 years of judicial distillation, case law, jurisprudence. Um, so Canada actually legislated a very a very good document with an notwithstanding clause, um, which now the Israelis are trying to say that's just what the override is. It's not, it's very different. But Canada is also a very different country. But Barack looked to the Canadian model more than any other model. If you look at Israeli jurisprudence, if you look at Supreme Court decisions in the 90s and in, 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 in this century as well, there are more references to the Canadian Constitution and precedents from the Canadian Supreme Court, obviously they're not binding in Israel, than any other, any other uh, country, including the United States, which is surprising. And Canadian law professors, and Canadian jurists, had an opportunity to engage their colleagues in Israel. And I remember actually being in Israel on one of these, on one of these uh, there were two of them, 92 and 94, I was privileged to be on both. The justice that I clerked with Clerk Four was a member of the delegation, and she invited me to come along as her guest. And Israel had just passed two basic laws. Their quasi-constitution Israel's two basic laws. One is human dignity and freedom, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, and the other is which was tragically translated into freedom of occupation. So somebody should have gotten fired from that agency, but that's how they translated it. Very, it has nothing to do with the occupation. It has to do, the right to earn a living, the right to travel, the right to move freely from place to place. So Barak read into these basic laws a quasi-constitutional platform. And because of the judicial selection process in Israel, he and his colleagues were able to veto selections of future, they don't get to choose who their colleagues are gonna be, but they can say who they won't be. Right? The judicial selection process in Israel is one of the three big things that are making the headlines. We'll talk about all three. So here today, the judicial selection process has been nine members of a committee, three of whom are members of the Supreme Court, two of whom are members of the Israeli Bar Association, the other four come from the Knesset. They could be the government, they could be just members of the Knesset. By convention, they had one who would, who would be from the opposition, not from the coalition, and you need seven out of nine to approve a selection. 
So think about it. If you need seven out of nine, and three of them are Supreme Court justices, sitting Supreme Court justices, they can veto anybody. I don't like that person. But because it's seven out of nine, so could the government. They could say, you know, the, the judges and the bar association people, they're all in cahoots, but we don't think that would be a particularly good juror. Certainly the three out of the four conventionally members of the coalition could block that. So sometimes they, they, they compromise by appointing two people and, um, you know, one sort of from each side to balance each other out. But there's no system, there's no selection process that I'm familiar with in the Western world where sitting justices effectively have a veto over who those colleagues are going to be. Then Justice Barak gets even more creative. He decides that anything is justiciable. I can rule as a Supreme Court whether or not you're mowing your lawn properly. And anybody has standing. That means I can complain about whether or not you're mowing your lawn properly even though I'm not your neighbor. And how is the court going to decide whether or not the, mow, the lawn is mowed properly? I'm being ridiculous just to make a point, but it's based on reasonableness. Reasonableness? That's a very fuzzy definition. And anything is justiciable? Why? It isn't that way anywhere in the world. And anybody has standing, any NGO, any non-governmental organs, non organs, why? What, what gives somebody who's not directly affected by the consequences of a lawsuit standing to go directly to the Supreme Court? As I said earlier, Israel only has two levels of courts. You've got the, what we call in Canada, the Superior Court, or Court of First Instance, here it's called the District Court, and, and the Supreme Court. There's no intermediate court of appeals like you have in the United States, both at the federal and state level. So if I'm to the center right in Israel, and the court remains very much left of center, I'm feeling very disenfranchised. We hear a lot about minority rights, and we should because they're important. So I fundamentally believe in protecting minority rights. What you never hear about, but I think is also very important, is protecting majority power. Right? If you, if you feel like you have a majority, you got elected, and you want to institute certain legislation and make certain changes, who's the court to tell me that I can't do it? If I want to appoint somebody to be a minister, who's the court? If, if the people elected me, and I'm indicted twice, convicted twice on tax fraud, like Darius, I, I, think, I think there should be some guidance whether or not people like that should serve. But if, and, and this went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said it's unreasonable, so Netanyahu had to fire Derry from his two ministerial posts in interior and, and, and in health. But they, they, there would have been a huge backlash if it was only on the basis of reasonableness. That's the whole crux of what's eating away at the, at the, at the right and center right in Israel. But there was also an estoppel point. When he did a plea a year ago to um, he basically cut a deal on his second conviction for, for, for tax, uh, tax fraud. Uh, he said he's not gonna, he's not gonna run again, he's not gonna seek public, public office. He just didn't want the judicial stamp of moral turpitude, which would have prevented him anyway legally for doing it for seven years, and then he came back and said, he didn't say that, I didn't really mean it. I was misquoted, the people really demanded that I come back. He's essentially still running those two ministries. I have no idea who the replacements are, and I don't think anybody does. He's sitting in his, in his house in Harnoff, but anything that needs to be done in the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Interior, they're running to Gary's house and they're, they're doing their business that way. So it's, it's, it's complicated. But that's where there was also a fair bit of overreaching. So if you're focused on the Israeli Supreme Court and the history of the power of the court relative to the other branch, not branches, Israel doesn't have a system like Canada in the United States. Israel has the judiciary and Israel has the Knesset. Yes, there is the government, which is the executive, and there's the rest of the Knesset, so there's the Mechokek and Mvatsea. The Mechokek is the legislative, Mvatsea is the implementer, but it's the same thing, right? The government controls the legislature. You never have a situation here where you can have the president from one party and you can have a senate from another party and a house from one of the other two parties. That doesn't happen in Israel. There's never been a situation. They tried three times to have direct um, elections for the prime minister for different reasons. But you're always going to have ideological consistency between the executive and the legislature. So it's really one, one body. 
So the only thing that was a check on that body, which is what people are aghast about, was the Supreme Court. And people felt they went too far. So the defenders of the court said, well, no, we didn't go too far, because in, in, in the 30 years since Barack's and his colleagues' judicial revolution, there have only been 22 instances where things were overturned, and, and that's true, and that's true. So it hasn't been that activist in terms of actually overturning stuff, but the genius of Barack, which he probably borrowed from Justice John Marshall, I mean, if anybody, now they you have the abortion cases, so people know Roe v. Wade, but if you go back historically, the most famous cases in American Supreme Court jurisprudence were um, Brown versus Board of Education, which desegregated, desegregated the schools, and going back a little further, Marbury versus Madison. That was the seminal case in American constitutional law in 1803, when then Chief Justice Marshall said, I am going to say what the government can do. So judicial review is the exclusive province of the Supreme Court. What happened, by the way, this was after John Adams lost the election to, um, to Thomas Jefferson, there was a fellow named Marbury who was supposed to get his commission, which is like a job, a government job. And um, Jefferson told uh, John Ma James Madison, who succeeded as president, then he was Secretary of State, don't, don't deliver the commission. Marbury sued for his commission, the government said, we're not giving it to you. The Supreme Court said, you know, we're gonna decide whether or not you can give it to him. And then they decided in favor of the government. So maybe they decided differently, the government would rejected the decision, but being a pragmatist, I guess Jefferson and Madison said, okay, great, so we don't want Marbury to get his commission, he didn't get it, if you think it's because you said so, have a nice day. Barack kind of did similar things. He kept telling the Israeli government that it's up to the court to decide what they can do, and then he let them do pretty more. He and his colleagues let them do pretty much whatever they wanted to do, with 22 exceptions in 30 years. That's not, that's not a lot, considering that in many cases the Supreme Court is the court of first instance. So what happens now, the, uh, the protests in the streets and the galvanization of the international community is all about taking away the one check on the one other part of government. If you think about the Canada or the United States, these are both federal systems where you have a federal government and provincial or state governments. You have a bicameral legislature. You have a House and a Senate. The Senate in Canada is weak, but it's still a higher body than Shekinah. You have writings in Canada, or in here you've got uh, you know, the Electoral College. You've got, to, you've got to try at least to have some sort of broad national appeal. You've got to be first past the post. So people, geographic dispersion. In Israel, just think of Israel as just one writing or one, one district. Right, we're in the 23rd district here, one district, that's it, just got one district, the whole country. One riot, the whole country. So the, the urge is just to you know, drive it down to your base. And the base of the center right now is extremely religious, right? Four of them. There's six parties in the coalition, six. Three of them are, you know, national religious, right? Noam and our, the religious Zionism and, and, and Ben Vir, uh, what's my Yudit. And two of them are ultra-Orthodox. I mean, Shas's, Shas's leadership is ultra-Orthodox. Most of their voters are. And UTJ is actually two, two, United, two ultra-Orthodox parties. We've got um, that the, the, the combined together, Aguda and Degala So yeah. if I be me, I'm saying, whoa, this is, this is, I don't know that anything scares them, but this is very different than it's ever happened before. To his, I don't know, to his credit, one of the many accomplishments um, in his very long political career, was completely taking over his own party. When Bibi was prime minister from 96 to 99, he did not have the broad support of the party. There were people who could have posed a credible threat. Sharon ultimately took over the party when Bibi lost um, to, to Barack in 1999. And what he learned when he came back was I need to reconfigure this party in my own image, and he did. And it became a party that resembles a little bit what the Republican Party looked like under Trump before they lost three consecutive elections, and people woke up and said, wait a second, maybe we need to take another look at this. And maybe if BB lost this past election, they would have done it too, but he didn't, he won. But he also was able to tab down any dissension within his own, within his own party by, um, by giving away all the cookies to his coalition party. Look, we talked about Derek getting 
health and, and interior. Ben Veer getting what was called public security, now national security, that's all the police. Smotrich getting not just finance ministry, but also some ministry the defense ministry, which has never happened before. But the, otherwise, he would have had his own party saying, wait a second, we're 32 out of the 64. Where are our plum assignments? And he was able to tell them, listen, you guys stay put. If I don't do what I'm doing, we don't have a coalition. I don't know how long that is going to last, but it's very clear that there isn't anybody within the Likud right now who can challenge Bibi. And he just felt that he needed to make sure that this coalition looked as stable as possible. So he really did give away a lot of cookies and lollipops. And then the race to judicial reform was really because people think it's all about the trial. It's not. Here I, here I just, I'm not, you know, I'm calling balls and strikes. I'm not taking a side here. This judicial revolution that people are complaining about is not driven by keeping BB out of jail. There's not enough time for that. Even if the, even if the trial lasts another, you know, eight years, the the change in the judicial selection process, which essentially is transferring from a joint veto between the government and the Supreme Court, is handing it all to the government. The new system keeps the three Supreme Court justices. But you now have three members of the government, the justice minister and two other ministers, and three members of the Knesset, one of whom is from the opposition. But you only need five out of nine. So there's no veto. Because if you have the three ministers, they're obviously from the coalition, and three members of government of the Knesset, but two of whom are from the coalition, you already have your five. So nobody else matters. There are no more vetoes. So essentially, the government gets to pick so this, is, this went from being a, a very elitist way of selecting uh, judges, probably the most elite way that I can think of, where essentially the court has such disproportionate impact on selecting their future colleagues, to just being purely political, worse than the United States. And just whoever I want to put on the court, I can. It would just take them a very long time to do that. So this isn't about keeping themselves out of jail, but it is very much about changing the look and feel of the judiciary in Israel. One of the reasons why Israel was able to sort of give the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, sorry, um, the proverbial legal finger for so many years is because the rest of the world recognized that Israel had a very credible domestic court. Even though that only 22 times they went against the government, the, and I don't want to get too technical, one of the other proposed changes in the judicial reform is that the legal advisors in each of the ministries used to be appointed by the Attorney General and report to the Attorney General, who's supposed to be independent from the government. Now they get to choose whoever they want. So I get to choose you as my legal advisor. You tell me that you don't like what I'm doing, that's fine, I'll choose you instead. So I can hire and fire anybody I want. So it's not really a, a, a check there whatsoever. So that's, that's pretty, Scary, you know, there's something called the law of complementarity, which means that the International Criminal Court will acknowledge that if you have this kind of entrenched rule of law, check and balance, that they'll back off and let, let, let your domestic country. Israel doesn't get treated as well as any other country, but you don't see people being pulled to the ICC from countries where bad things happen because there's a high level of confidence that they'll be judged fairly by international norms in their home country. Israel may lose that if, if this judicial reform uh, goes through. So you have the judicial selection process and the basic laws we talked about a little bit. The second part of the judicial reform that gets everybody upset is that the Supreme Court under the new proposal will not have the right to overturn basic laws. So they can willy-nilly call everything a basic law. What people don't appreciate is Israel's never had a super majority requirement. It's not, and then, sorry, that's the override. Now the override is that even if the court comes back and says that what you're doing is illegal, the Knesset can just come back and do it all over again with 61. You need 61 to have a coalition. So obviously you're gonna be able to garner the 61 to once again give the proverbial legal finger to the Supreme Court. Thank you very much for your opinion, we're gonna do it anyway. In the United States it doesn't work that way. In the United States if you want um, if, you're, if, you, if someone tells you that a law is unconstitutional, you've got to change it. I mean, many times things get re-legislated to be more uh, 
you know, palatable from a from a constitutional perspective. Israel's Israel's going to lose that, uh, and and I think that's what worries a lot of people. Today is the one year anniversary of the Ukrainian conflict. There was another thing that I you know I, I wanted to talk about when we put together the agenda. I'm going to talk about it next week, and look at who the geopolitical winners and losers are. But and this is no comparison whatsoever between Bibi and Putin. But I think that the right is somewhat surprised. Not so much, not so much by the protests in the street, but the way that the noise has been able to galvanize people around the world, right? The, I think the, 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 the Zelensky's biggest accomplishment, in addition to having you know, the Ukrainian military fight more effectively than people anticipated, people thought Putin would be in Kiev in, in hours or days, certainly not sort of struggling in a stalemate a year later, is just how the international community has rallied. In Canada, you had from former Chief Justice Beverly, Beverly McLaughlin and nine other former um, justices of the Canadian Supreme Court, justices from each of the major courts of appeal, law professors, I mean, 108 signatories to a letter, essentially saying things similar to what we've been talking about this afternoon, that this is, that this is not the right way to do things. This will emasculate the independence of the judiciary in Israel. And Israel will lose a lot of um, admiration. And people are now threatening to pull their money out of Israeli-oriented venture capital funds. Israeli entrepreneurs and high-tech uh, business leaders are threatening to move their companies out of the country. That hasn't happened. And I don't think it will happen, certainly not to a degree. But the fact that people are talking about it is not helpful. And if somebody spends a certain amount of my time on what I call broadly Israel advocacy issues, it's become really hard. And I'm pretty active with APAC, and I have a you know, congressional representative that's sort of my guy. He's a Democrat from North Carolina. He gave a terrific speech on the House floor on Holocaust Remembrance Day. He's a good friend. He's a good friend of mine. He's a great friend of Israel. But he asks legitimate questions. What, what, what's going on? Why is this happening? What is... You know, what are, what are we supposed to do? Who's supposed to say? You know, Ambassador Tom Knights said, pump the brakes, hold on, let's see what's happening. Uh, there was a suggestion that we can have a conversation and see where it goes. But Lapid and God, so everybody now, I said, if I use the Ukrainian analogy, I'm not going to use it anymore, but everybody wants to be Zelensky. Right? Gantz wants to be Zelensky. Lapid wants to be Zelensky. Um, but Putting aside that for a second, the, the reputational challenge, the one, you know, the, the, the um, high road that Israel was always able to point to because of protection of human rights and equality, you know, for the most part, the, you know, yes, women can drive, LGBTQ rights are protected. I don't think they're in jeopardy. I really don't. Even though you've got uh, five out of the six members of the coalition being either um, ultra-orthodox or, 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 or very orthodox. And, and all five of those parties that they could choose would want to run Israel as an Alaskan state. I'm not afraid of that happening, not because I want Israel to be a Alaskan state. I just don't think, you know, that's, that's, that's not on the table. But this idea of the judicial selection process and the override clause, there's no consensus in the government about what's more important. Folks in Likud, and I think even the um, you know, conservatives in the, in the religious national, uh, Zionist party are fine with judicial selection. Let's have the government choose judges. We don't need the override clause. The ultra-Orthodox say, no, that's exactly what we need, because they're never going to participate in, in, in appointing judges. Barak, who I talked about earlier, said maybe we should have an ultra-Orthodox member of the court. And Rabbi El Yashiv, who was then the leader of the Litvak Jewish Hasidic community, said, no, 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 we're not having an Orthodox rabbi sitting on what's essentially still a, a secular court. We, we stick to the rabbinic courts. They're the ones who are insisting on the override because their fear is that some future Knesset is going to once again try to compel their students to serve in the army. That's their biggest thing. As much as they want money for their yeshivot, as much as they want stipends for the many, many kids that are being born, their biggest issue is Keeping, keeping, keeping their uh, their their young men out of the out of the military. Uh, separate conversation. I, you know, there are lots of different views on this, but 
I think, and you're hearing this here first, and I actually just thought about it when, when I came over here this morning, I think there is going to be a discussion. And I think that the introduction of, in the first reading that they did this week, they talked about changing the selection process of judges. I passed on the first reading. You need, you need three readings, but because this wasn't presented by the government, it was presented as a private member's bill, seemed corrupt, and they're actually you need four readings. So there's, there's time, and usually legislation comes out looking appreciably different than the way it came in. The judicial selection process will get changed. The right to, uh, or the denial of the right of the Supreme Court to overturn a basic law may actually pass. And then I think the government goes to, or the, you know, the coalition goes to the opposition and says, you know, we'll give in on the override. Because if you look at public perception, that's the one that everybody says, well, okay, yes, it's the will of the people. Protect the power of the majority. But not with 61 out of 120, that's too narrow. Bring back the sun had rain when they had needed 71. Give me 71 out of 120. Give me a, some sort of super majority. You have super majorities. To change the Constitution of the United States, you need a super duper majority, right? So, which is why constitutions don't get amended very often here. But there I think, and I haven't heard anybody talk about this yet, there I think they could really do something that's quite mischievous. If they're able to put, push the first two through, so the government gets to choose the judges, the Supreme Court doesn't have the right to overturn a basic law, there's no restriction on what can be called a basic law, anything can essentially be called a basic law, and then you accede to a supermajority, make it as high as possible, right? The thing that I tell people when they're really, really agitated about what's going on, great, you'll have another election in two, three, four years from now, and then all you need is 61 votes to undo the whole thing. If they can bulletproof this incredible reform with a supermajority and make it look like they're giving something to the opposition and following President Herzog's admonitions and preventing the, 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 the threat of civil war, that would, be, that would be quite a coup. That really would be a judicial coup. Look, what makes me sad, and I know it's up for questions, what makes me sad more than anything else, having you know, spent some time with all of you and following this for, for years, is the grandstanding, the uh, lack of any oxygen for even-handedness, both-sidedness. When I told you about my friends on the previously, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, I've been excoriated for not agreeing with them. I, 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 I've been called chilly bad names because I don't see the world exclusively through their monochromatic prism. And I'm not saying they're wrong. And I'm certainly not saying that I'm right. But I'm saying that the, um, the capacity for listening, the capacity for compromise has been sucked out of the conversation. There isn't any. And as a consequence, it's, it's, it's a take no prisoners. We either need to win or we've lost. And we didn't lose the battle, we lost our country. We lost the soul of the Jewish people. We witnessed the third destruction, uh, or the destruction of the third temple. And, and the hyperbolic terms that are being used to describe the consequences of the conflict are scary because we live in echo chambers, so we all have access to whatever media and sources of information that we choose. And the, the opposition has been extremely effective. We'll talk about this in the Ukrainian context next week, but extremely effective in getting support from a very broad range of constituencies, from the high tech sector, from the national security establishment, from academia, uh, business leaders, the Bank of Israel, and then outside of Israel, from the federations, from, the, I mentioned the Canadian jurists, people who are not knee-jerk Israel bashers. These are people who genuinely love Israel, from within and without. But the, uh, the warning signal to me is not so much how this is gonna change the role of the Supreme Court, which I'm a little bit concerned about. I think that recognizing there's a screaming need to remedy the overreach that's taken place over the past 30 years. Um, but but the, 
broader impact that it has on Israeli society and Israel's relationship with the diaspora and sort of our, our, our pride in, in being part of the Jewish people and recognizing that we have a country that has accomplished so much in such a short space of time. I don't think that's going to go away. I don't think the shekel is going to implode. I don't think the high-tech sector is going to disappear. But I think that, um, you know, we're playing with matches and, uh, you know, and there's a lot of kerosene in the room. Uh, so for those of you who know me, I've always been an optimist. I always tried to put down my rose-colored glasses and, and portray the world through, through that perspective. I, I haven't lost those glasses, but I'm very much troubled by what's going on. I hope this has been a little bit elucidating and I'm happy to take questions. Yes, I'll repeat the question. Okay, I'll repeat both questions. <laughs> what democracy? What has to do with democracy? Absolutely. So I, I don't think I really heard your first question, but democ is Israel's democracy in jeopardy? No. The point is that democracy is being, is being, uh, Israel's being exposed to being undemocratic in this procedure. Okay. So, so it actually, I don't think that's fair. I think that that allegation that Israel's democracy is disappearing is not fair. You know, we just saw the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th elections in Israel from April 2019 to November 2022. Those were the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th um, uh, free and fair elections in the history of the Middle East. So when you talk about Israel being a democracy, and I think this is very important for all of you who are having conversations with people who want to malign Israel as a democratic country, remind them what Israel is and how it got to be here, right? Um, Israel was sort of the promised land. We, we, have, we get Israel from the Bible, and the Bible is, is replete with democracy, right? Wrong. I don't know if there are any biblical scholars in the room, but I challenge you to give me one example, one example of an election in the history of the Bible. Five books of Moses, the whole time, the prophets, the chronicles. We don't come from a history of democracy. We just don't. You know, kings were anointed and appointed, and prophets spoke directly to God. There was never the will of the people determining the out outcome. When Korah demanded that there be some sort of democratic, um, you know, appeasement, he was swallowed up by the ground. So, along with all of, all, all, all of his colleagues, undemocratically. But, but the people who came to Israel later, in the Aliyot, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, they came from democracies. They did not. They came from Tsarist Russia. Sure, people came from France and England called them democracy. But the people who came to Israel had no real experience with democracy, and yet it, we have a democracy. Why? Because of where they came. They came to a place where democracy was a given, the Middle East. Right. So that's not true. So the fact that you take these three factors into consideration and want to say that Israel is not a democracy, that's, that's just not fair. This, this, this was, a, this was a, an election that was transparent. It was, it, no, nobody's saying that people stuffed ballots or stole ballots. You know, in a true democracy, people get the leadership they deserve. This is not what half the country wants. Um, and because the environment is so polarizing, they feel that this is not what I wanted. It's like, this, this, is, this is exactly what I don't want. Right? So it's not like getting on an airplane and then the joke about flying LL, you have two choices for dinner, yes or no. But, but let's say you, know, you, you can choose not to eat. You're just saying, no, I'm, I'm not only did I not get my steak, I'm given something that I'm completely allergic to. 
Um, as to your second question regarding executive action, yes, you're absolutely right. The executive actions, the appointment of SARS, I argue that the entire administrative law infrastructure in Canada and the United States is a usurpation of what would otherwise belong to the legislature. But it's still subject to judicial review. It is taking from the, from the legislature to the executive, but it is always, always, always subject to that oversight. Yes. Yeah, that's true. So that, that's true. I mean, certainly in little communities in the shadow you had, but, 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 but there's a difference to choosing a guy by building the state. But, but, but I, I, certainly they were, they were exposed to, I mean, even in a family, right? We're going to go have Chinese or Mexican. Right? You, can have, you can have a vote on lots of things. But when you think about nation building, you know, establishing a sovereignty, I think that we should wake up in the morning and go to bed at night applauding what, what, what has been accomplished in this world. Was that your question? Okay. 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 Do you have a question? Okay, great. Go ahead. Very what? He's very aware of my public opinion. Yeah. The public can act for this place and all this can be said to public It's going to be the US, it's going to be the US. It's more people down there, the extreme left, the right, the extreme right. Actually, if you know what these people, the extreme right, might be the best. Because the material wants to be the top. Right. So, it, 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 I mean, I agree with that statement. What's the question? <laughs> the question is, I think, I think what he wants to do is, he's, he's a little bit concerned about it. the end of the year, and I don't know, it's going to be wrong. He wants to destroy it. Well, he certainly has a funny way of doing them, doing it by appointing. I mean, I, I, the question, by the way, for those of you who hear it, is that Prime Minister Netanyahu is very um, aware of public opinion, both in Israel and the United States, and he's been uh, carefully choreographing his public image for, for decades. And now, when he's brought Smotrich, who's the head of the Religious Zionist Party, and Ben Gvir, who's the head of the Otsma Yehudi, he's essentially brought them in to destroy them. Look, that's, that's giving somebody expanded powers over the uh, um, over national public security and somebody appointing somebody your finance minister and giving him another ministry, the Ministry of Defense, that's not historically an effective way to destroy something. Actually, Sharon tried to do the same thing to Netanyahu in 2003. After Sharon won his second election, he told Bibi, you know what, you get to be the finance minister, which historically was a place where people um, kind of get politically destroyed because you have limited budgets and everybody wants a, you know, their hand in the cookie jar. And Netanyahu, contrary to expectations, was a transformational finance minister. And it had more than anything else to do with, to rehabilitate his career. He privatized a lot of companies, the national oil refineries, LL, all of the banks were, were, were privatized during his watch. So I, I don't know that he's empowering them to destroy them. I think on the other hand, what they may be doing, or may be thinking, I think they, you know, they're up against a very formidable political force. But, um, but I, I think, if anything, he's perceived as having been weakened by doling out so many gifts to, uh, to those parties and their friends. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, if Netanyahu is able to do what he wants to do with judicial reform and placate his parties in the Likud, by the way, it's people in the Likud that want that more. The, 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 the ultra-Orthodox, all they really want is keep, keep, keep their people out of the army, uh, religious nationalism, really what they want is they want to annex the West Bank, the Dove Shabon, and, and build more settlements. The Likud really wants this judicial reform because they feel like it's their majority power that's been emasculated by the, by the Supreme Court. Not just the 22 decisions, but every time when somebody would come up with a suggestion of a law or, or, or a policy, and the answer always was, Mr. Likud was the way of all my guts. The, the, the Supreme Court will strike this down. So this chilling effect that was created as a result of that 
usurpation of judicial power during the past 30 years is what's really why then we could. Um, I think if he if he's able to do what he wants, he then can go to Gantz or Lapid and see what happens and say, I'm 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 ready to bring you in if you want to, because that's that's not something they would ever ever agree to within a coalition. Maybe if the Ben Beers and the Smotriches start looking so odious to the international community, and Bibi would much rather have that person to his left that he, for the first time, doesn't have. He, he would do a deal, and in that case, yes, it would be substantially weakened. And then they'd have to decide what Bennett decided in 2021. Is it important enough for me to have political power or you know, compromise on my you know, ideology? I, I don't know what will happen. Uh, yeah, we'll have here in the right. Yeah, my question is, the religious party, are they all in a coalition as to what they want? So there are two factions. I think I understood the second question. The first question was, are the religious parties are all coalition what they want? The answer to that is absolutely not. Um, is it the tail wagging the dog? Who's, who's the tail, who's the dog? Religious controlling Netanyahu. Uh, so, no. I mean, at, at the end of the day, Netanyahu is not, you know, he's, he, he's not a neophyte, he's not a wallflower. He knows, he knows what his priorities are. But if something is not a priority for him, he's, he's, he's got enough scars and bruises, he'll take some hits to push his own priority, and this is why he's able to go to some religious factions and say, hold off on some of the settled and building, accept what the United States is guiding us because we want to prioritize judicial reform. That is a priority for him. Not necessarily to stay out of jail, but to see a court that looks more like the country, which it doesn't. Um, so I don't think it's the tail wagging the dog. I, I, you know, to, to your point, I don't think that he brought them into his government to, to, to neutralize them. But I don't get a sense yet that they're pushing him in a direction that he's completely uncomfortable in. And I think that if, he, if they do, and he can't find a creative way out of that, there are so many obvious coalition partners. This is one of the things that Americans, Canadians really don't get about Israel. Israel is a very much center-right country. If Bibi were not the head of the Likud, you would have at least, at least another 20, maybe 30 Knesset members who would be happy to sit in a coalition with the Likud party led by anybody else, by you, by me, by Mickey Mouse, anybody in the people. So, so, so there, is, there is a national consensus in Israel that's stronger than there's ever been. But, pardon the, 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 the pun, it's trumped by me because, because, because of who he is. Yeah, Ron, right, right. So we have, so it's a great question. People, Rod's question is, um, you know, if, if you really have uh, potentially 80 or 90 members of the Knesset who are much more aligned, I mean, you lose, you lose the ultra-Orthodox. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be more than 80, but 80 out of 120 is unprecedentedly staggering. Um, you know, so where's, where's the center leadership to, to bring all that together? It doesn't exist. And the reason it doesn't exist in Israel um, is not that different from why it doesn't exist here. There are um, there are too many people who want to be that leader, right? So it's you know, there's not one person, one woman or man who's standing up and saying, "Listen, this is, Lapid came the closest." Lapid, to his credit, did something that nobody that I'm I haven't seen any of this in, 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 in you know the history of Western democracies where he had you know 17, 18 seats. And Bennett had six, and he basically wanted you to be prime minister. You know, take a turn. He knew that he never really had a full term, so he got to be there for a couple of months while the election process was going on. But he basically said, "This is more important than me sitting in the top, you know, in the top seat. You do it." He was still running a lot of things behind the scenes, and he was the foreign minister. So that, that to me, was somewhat statesmanlike. 
but there isn't anybody right now. Everybody agrees with what you're saying, and I want to be the boss. Well, what about letting her be the boss? No, 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 she's good. She, I'll, 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 I'll bring her in, I'll listen to her. What about him? He's good too, but I want to be the boss. And, and even the protests aren't um, organized. You know, everybody's trying to outdo each other. Everyone's trying to, as I said earlier, maybe it wasn't clear, everyone's trying to be Zelensky. Everyone's trying to say that, 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 that uh, this is despotic, it's dictatorial, it's autocratic, it's the end of democracy. It makes our job here in the diaspora very, very unpleasant. Sharansky, I think, came out and said, you know, I listened to Levin, you know, Yair Levin, who's the Minister of Justice, and I immediately agreed with the opposition. Because this guy is so radical, so, you know, out of touch, that, that you know, the opposition has to be right. Then I listened to the opposition, I kind of agree with Levin, right? <laughs> So, uh, people don't want to buy um, centrist, moderate content. People really want to buy into like, you know, the, 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 the highest octane single malt scotch, right? Nobody wants to drink red label anymore. So, um, any more questions? Yes. That's an indication of just how passionate you know feelings are in Israel right now. Because I, I I certainly relate to your perspective. Um, I'm not saying I relate to personally. I, I, obviously, this is a tragic story, and, and and I would think that the punishment should be a lot harsher. I don't, I'm not familiar with the specific case, but yeah, I think that a lot of people don't feel that, the, that this effective veto that the Supreme Court and the two members of the Bar Association could block any appointee. They can't put somebody in. Right? The reason they can't put somebody in is because right now you need seven out of the nine. But they can certainly block people that they don't want in, and they have. And that's why the new suggestion is only five out of the nine. But it's, uh, you know, if you look at the numbers and if you look at the practical effect of what that would mean, and if you look at the composition of the current Israeli government and the likely composition of prospective Israeli governments for the foreseeable future, uh, the, the pendulum will just swing in the, other, in the other direction. And if, you know, somebody who I assume has your um, perspective on, on justice and politics, that, that, that's a good result for people who don't, then that's a bad result. I don't have an answer. I, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts and opinions, but that's not what this is for. My, my job is to sort of help explain what the situation is now and how they're trying to change it. Um, yes, oh, you have a question. Yes. Uh, it's my opinion that Netanyahu has shot himself in the foot. He was very liked in the United States because he was fluent in English. We felt he was one of us. And now he sways from one party to the other because he wants to be the leader. He doesn't have a set of standards. And I feel that many of the Jews in the United States who give to the federations here or in their hometown will be leery of giving money because about a third of it goes to Israel. Have you ever heard the question? So the, the comment was the question, but I do want to respond to it. So the comment was that uh, Netanyahu used to be beloved, um, and you mentioned because his English was impeccable. His English is still impeccable. So I can tell you with confidence that, that he hasn't lost his communicative skills. But 
you feel that he used to be more principled and now he's lost his principles. Um, so look, he's a politician. I don't know what his principles were. I don't know what his principles are. Uh, if you wanted to fire a politician anytime she or he changed their perspective on things, then you know we'd be pretty busy getting rid of folks. Um, which is which, which is what a true and vibrant democracy should be. Your last comment is the one I really want to respond to, and I think you're right. When you said the people in the federations you know, recognizing a third of their money is going to Israel, I don't know if that's the exact percentage, but a high percentage goes to Israel, um, will hold back on their on their generosity because they don't agree with Israel's policies. And, and maybe, maybe I'll close with this. This is the time to step up your love for Israel. It's really easy. It's really easy to be supportive when you agree with everything that's going on. It's really easy to support schools and hospitals if you have the resources, when you recognize what a you know, critical contribution they're making to a country that we care about. This is a much more challenging period. This is a period where people are gonna say, you know what, Israel, let me take a break for a while. You got your high tech sector, your economy strong, we'll let you take care of your own. That'd be a big mistake. Israel's economy is strong, and Israeli philanthropists are stepping up and playing more of a role, perhaps not enough of a role, in supporting their own institutions, their educational, their medical, their research institutions. I think a lot more can be done uh, specifically by the local Israeli community, but we still have a role here too. And whether it's buying Israel bonds, that just send a message that the support for Israel is still there. Supporting Federation sends a message that the relationship between Israel and the diaspora, between Israel and Canada, Israel and the United States, remains very strong. Um, coming to sessions like this, being involved in your synagogues, attending Yom Ha'atzmaut or other Israeli celebrations, I think that we're gonna do ourselves as a community a very big disservice if we allow a few policies of a current government, whatever those policies are, and whichever that government is, take away our Zionism, take away our love for Israel, take away our inclination to express that love, express that Zionism meaningfully and practically. It's a choice. You know, I'm not, I'm, I'm a Jew. Thank you. So uh, I'll still be here for a few minutes. If you have uh, a question or two, I'm happy to answer it. Yeah, okay, probably to the minute. So the, the question is, do I think that the American media is doing a fair, credible job reporting on the situation? I'm assuming you mean the judicial reform. Yes. Yes. So, look, the, the, there's nothing mainstream about the mainstream media. And you're right, I don't think most Americans are reading the Truth or Post or reading, or reading uh, the Times of Israel and certainly not reading the Hebrew language stuff. To the extent that this is interesting to the general American population, I think that they're doing their level best to describe the situation. And I think responsible journalists from the stuff that I've read, including, and I hate to say this, the New York Times and other, other publications that have historically, certainly recently, not been friendly to Israel, not been accurate in their reporting, are being accurate. And, and we're giving them the ammo to be accurate, because what they're saying is that the people in Israel are aghast. The protesters are showing up in unprecedented numbers. And they are decrying this government's policies for undermining Israeli democracy. They are trying to convert a, you know, an independent judiciary into a tool of a dictatorial regime. And they're trying to go from, but they're not saying that's happening. They're saying people in Israel are turning up in droves to protest this trend of turning Israel into Hungary, turning Israel into Turkey, turning Israel into Poland, turning Israel into... So they don't have to say that's happening. All they have to do is say that this is the accusation of what's transpiring, and in that sense they're being accurate. Because the people in the streets are giving them the opportunity to report fairly that that's what's going on. 
And that's why I'm, I'm very saddened by the fact that so many people in Israel, they should protest, they should definitely express themselves. But when you start invoking, oh, Israel's becoming a theocracy like Iran, Israel's not Iran. And even if it became a halakhic state, it wouldn't kill gays, and it wouldn't um, you know, completely disenfranchise people who are not, you know, mullah. So, so, and then, you know, God forbid all the, all the, all the, all the, all the Nazi comparisons. I mean, they're just so out of bounds. But they enable folks from the New York Times and the Washington Post and other credible leading publications to report on this accurately. Because um, if I can come full circle to your question, I don't know if BB shot herself in the foot, but I think we run the risk of shooting ourselves in the foot if we um, don't make sure that the gun is loaded and put it away in a safe drawer and use other ammunition to, you know, to communicate, especially with each other. Shabbat shalom. I'll be coming back next Friday, so if there are more questions and more stuff, we'll have, we'll have time to talk about it.